Welcome to the Three Down Nation podcast. I'm Justin Dunk, joined by John Hodge, who did his tour through half of the East Division and is now back in the peg. No, he's not a Bombers homework, people. And J.C. <laughs> Abbott. Hodge, how was your trip? Well, nothing interesting happened at either <laughs> game, so that was too bad. But uh, no, in all seriousness, it was a great trip. I thoroughly enjoyed both buildings. I did extensive tours, uh, some accompanied, some unaccompanied, of both buildings. I have now done the entire East Division, including Halifax, which hopefully at some point in the next, I don't know, 10, 20 years, we'll get a decent stadium. That'd be nice. But uh, I, I, I liked both facilities. I, I, I really did. If I had to give the edge to either, it'd be BMO. Uh, the seats at BMO are terrible. Uh, they're cheap and plasticky, but everything else I really like the sound, the game production from the Argos is great. Um, it, it does feel more like TFC's building than the Argos building, but I love the gray cup banners from the Argos. Ben Grant, our boy from here at three down nation, obviously it was wonderful to see him catching up with Adam Goss, some league people, some Argos people, some Sam Peters people, the night before at TD Place was interesting, and I will talk more about it in the show. Um, the new side of TD is very nice. The old side is not, but it's also being replaced in five to six years. So I know Red Blacks fans won't have to worry about that for much longer. I think you cursed us with uh, saying that I did. it's going to happen <laughs> when you're going well, on Well, I didn't curse trip. us. You cursed the league. cursed me. <laughs> oh, I cursed me. Me. This is all about me, JC. <laughs> Hodge's famous last words. I believe it was off air, so to speak. You said, if something happens at the Red Blacks Riders game, I'll go to the media scrums. Lo and behold, there was a whole bunch of wild stuff that went on. Hodge, what'd you do? Hit the panic button there and stuff went crazy? I, I Hit think that red button? <laughs> I think the exact quote was, if something bat blank crazy happens. <laughs> Uh, that was, I think, the terminology I used. And lo and behold, the command center in and of itself was bat blank crazy. <laughs> then there was an altercation. And I'm very glad that we had a reporter there. Uh, I look forward to talking about that at length later on in the show because I've corroborated what I've seen with the videos that I've taken, the photos I've taken, and then other reporters who were there. So I think I've got the full story for our listeners. And I think it's an important story to tell. That's the way you tease it. Let's go. Today, we're discussing Nathan Rourke being released by the Atlanta Falcons. Possibly six CFL teams changing quarterbacks for week 11. The incident that occurred along Ottawa's bench following the Red Blacks tie against Saskatchewan. Mid-season CFL award winners. Brian Ramsey leaving the CFLPA. And the league reviewing Chad Kelly's bid for reinstatement. But first. The Week 10 game between the Riders and Red Blacks ended in a controversial tie as the command center made some interesting calls. First, Corey May successfully challenged for pass interference on Elijah McGee and overtime after it briefly looked like the Red Blacks had won. And having been there, I can attest, the fireworks went off and everything. Later, the command center stepped in to prolong the game again after it appeared Saskatchewan had won, calling roughing the passer on Malik Carney, which negated a Dustin Crum fumble. If fans on both sides weren't mad enough, the game ended in a tie. JC, where does the CFL go from here? I think there's two elements to this question. The first is the overarching theme that has been officiating in the command center this season. And the second is what happened in this game. And I'll touch on the first one initially because it's pretty clear with the amount of outpouring, the outcry after this game, that fans are fed up. They're confused. They don't know what the rules are. They don't know how this game is being officiated and how the command center is making their calls. And things are spiraling. This is not our first instant this season where things have been questionable. 
to say the least. It wasn't the only one this week where there was a questionable call that had a major impact on the game. I mean, in Toronto and Calgary, there is a fumble that Cam Judge could have returned all the way back for a touchdown that was essentially erased by a quick whistle from the referees. So this has been something we've discussed for the last several weeks. It's become an issue. And somebody from the league, whether that is the head of officiating, whether that's a referee themselves, whether that's Commissioner Randy Ambrosi, has to come forward, answer some questions, and provide fans with some sort of clarity as to what is being done to address this, to you know, smooth over their concerns and ensure that this is not the biggest storyline for the second half of the CFL season like it's been the first. When it comes to this particular game, I understand why people are are upset. It was certainly the type of finish that would uh, rub both fan bases the wrong way. Everyone was hit equally by it. And I think my biggest critique is that the referees at the end should have taken a little bit more control to ensure that people didn't think this game was over when a turnover is, of course, automatically reviewed by the command center. And that's something that we've known for a long time. They should have held off. They should have immediately said that the play was under review and we wouldn't have had such a gap, such confusion, uh, players in the locker room, people thinking that the game was over. The calls themselves, I actually don't have a problem with. And I think that the officials and the command center got them both right. They were ticky-tack. They were, uh, you know, close calls. But that's why the officials on the field don't throw the flag. They allow it to go to the command center and to a challenge or a review. And then the people with the better vantage and the replay And all of those benefits are able to make a call to the letter of the law. And I don't think you can argue on either case that they weren't to the letter of the law the correct call. Now, you can argue that a guy being cut shouldn't be flagged for roughing the passer, but that's not what the law says. The rule book states that no matter what your trajectory or if you're being pushed or whatever happens before, you cannot go low on a quarterback. And unfortunately... Uh, Jacoby McLean was low on the quarterback Zacobi. on that play. J- Zacoby? Is that how it is? Okay. Zacoby McLean was low on the quarterback on that play, just as Miles Brown was earlier in the game when Drew Brown got hurt. That is the letter of the law. It's there for a reason. And uh, the command center got it right, even if fans don't want to admit it. The issue, JC, you touched on it, is the time between the game literally being whistled as over in the command center, reviewing this call, pulling players, coaches, officials back on the field. And the reason for that is player safety. Randy Ambrosi talks about this, that he gets up thinking about the players and their safety every day, which is a line that is just so bogus in and of itself, but we're not going to go down that road, that... When you end a football game, there is a level of intensity, pressure, focus. Guys talk about changing personalities when they go between those white lines and buckle up the chin strap and put on the pads. And then once the game is over, you come down from that adrenaline rush, from that focus, from that intensity, thinking that it's over. That to me, is way more dangerous than Miles Brown falling into Drew Brown or Zacoby McLean getting called for, you know, what I think is, yes, correct by the letter of the law, but this bogus roughing the passer on Dustin Crum. But aside from that, that to me is the scary part of this situation, is if you're going to talk about the command center and the officials having control of a football game, they did not at the end of the game. And it is unsafe for that to happen, for players to be in the dressing room and then tell them that now that they've come down off of this high, so to speak, or this focus and this intensity, that they got to go back out there and strap it up. You can't just flick that switch that quickly. And the majority of the players did. I give them full credit for that. But to me, that was the most dangerous aspect from the – actual football game we'll get into later 
what happened between the benches there. But to me, that is the major issue. And the CFL needs to come out and give a thorough statement with regards to what happened from the game being whistled dead to the review process and literally pulling people back onto the field. That is what has Ryder Nation so enraged. And I think people around the CFL so enraged. If you want to talk about player safety, you need to actually walk it. And to me, that did not happen in this situation. Yeah, it was not a good night, right, for the CFL as a whole. I mean, uh, maybe on the one hand, it's nice that the controversial ending took away from how unbelievably poorly played and boring the first 55 minutes of this game was. Now, part of that was the weather. I do want to be fair. The weather was not good. Um, Fortunately, it was dry in the press box. I was getting attacked by spiders. That's a story for a different day. Um, Yeah, honest. If if anybody, full, full warning, if you go to the press box and open the windows at TD Play Stadium, that the windows are infested with spiders. That is true. Uh, but I didn't have to worry about rain. Uh, the players did. The issue to me here is perfection sometimes is the enemy of good, right? For decades in the CFL, we had some egregious calls. Every once in a while, something would be flagrantly missed. And everybody fantasized about the days when we could just automatically review everything and get everything perfectly right. The issue is, in a situation like this at the end of the game, and I agree with JC's assessment, these calls were all made correct by the letter of the law. To me, review should be something that's used to make sure that nobody going 90 in a 60 zone goes unpenalized. It should not mean that we catch everybody who does 61, right? But it's also unfair to go to the replay official and say, hey, if it technically meets the, 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 the requirements for a penalty, but, you know, it's not that bad, just leave it. Because now they're no longer using their judgment. They, or pardon me, they're not, they're not using the letter of the law. They're, they're having to use kind of subjective analysis. Yeah, this is a penalty, but is it really a penalty? Do we really, like, look, I'm almost at the point where I would be happy to scrap the command center and scrap all reviews and just go old school. And just call the game. Because at the end of the day, we are more than ever before. I've read the CFL's rule book this past week and prepped for a column that I'm writing. And it has made my head spin about 17 different times. It by, and by the way, confirms that I made the right decision not going to law school. <laughs> because <laughs> if I can't read this, I don't know how I'd handle some of the legal jargon that those guys have to. But the point is, the rules now are ultra complicated specifically to make sure or specifically to make sure that we don't make egregious mistakes. They're too complicated for the fans, especially casual fans to get. And no one's happy. Like we are so passionately pursuing. Well, what if we got every call perfect? And in trying to do that, we've kind of, we, we, we've slowed down the game drastically we're making calls that, that don't seem to make sense to the average person. And it's, it's not satisfying for anybody. Like, like, who wins by trying to get every call perfect? What if we just trusted the officials to make the calls? And yeah, they're going to make mistakes, just like receivers are going to drop passes. Quarterbacks are going to throw picks. DBs are going to miss hits or, or, or D linemen are going are gonna to push the wrong gap. Like, like, like so players make mistakes, officials make mistakes. Why don't we just trust that they even each other out? Because I get it that 30 years ago, the idea of just reviewing everything with replay sounded, sounded like an amazing opportunity. Well, slowly since replay was in, implemented in 2006, it's been almost 20 years of this, we've added layers and layers and layers of complexity. And I don't think anybody would suggest that the game is more entertaining now than it was 20 years ago. So that's why I'm almost in the camp of just scrap it all. Is that going to happen? No, because the CFL has used too much resources over the years trying to get this right. But I'm almost there, boys. I never thought I'd say that. I used to like the reviews. I used to like the, the trying to get it perfect. But perfect is the enemy of good, especially when trying to get it perfect kind of makes it stink. I'm not quite there with you yet, Hodge. I'm still 
in favor of replay review. And I think this year, while there are some issues that need to be addressed, clearly is more of an anomaly than a part of a trend. Because going into this season, if you ask me about the command center or officiating in the CFL, I would have said, yeah, there are a few er errors here and there. They're never going to make everybody happy. But generally, especially in the last couple of seasons, it's been very good. This year, that hasn't been the case. And I think the biggest thing you can do to address that is make this whole process accountable, right? And I talked about it a little bit before, but why is it that we've got a still shot on TSN of a bunch of people staring at a computer screen and we don't have audio of what they're going through? Maybe people would not be so up in arms about a call if they heard what the officials were talking about and what was what was going into that decision? What if the replay official was made available after the game to the media to justify a call, to explain what went into the decision? So there wasn't that confusion about why they stepped in here and didn't step in here. That doesn't seem unreasonable to me at all. And, and from a broadcasting, a presentation standpoint, why doesn't TSN have a rules analyst or somebody like so many NFL broadcasts do that can step in with an expert opinion and provide insight instead of people just speculating and guessing who, frankly, while they may know a lot about football, have probably not read the rule book cover to cover and have never been in a situation where they've had to make a call themselves or assess a replay review. We could be doing so much more top to bottom, to ensure that this is communicated more effectively, to make sure that there is not confusion, and that fans are given answers. Because you are never going to get every single call right, Hodge. You are correct in that. But at the very least, just like players are held accountable for mistakes or coaches are asked questions about you know difficult decisions that they made rightly or wrongly, Officials should be held to the same account, too, and it benefits the league to do that. You know, JC, that makes me think of a great idea. I believe it was Tom Valesi who was head of the command center that night, right, Hodge? That's correct, according to the game notes. Have a headset there ready, and if there is a call that needs to be explained, just like an official would do on the field, have the head of the command center jump on that headset with TSN, give him a cue or have the play-by-play -play man, whoever that is, Rod Smith or Dustin Nielsen, set him up and he can explain either what's going on there in the command center or why they got to a certain call. In this instance, the call that extended, or I should say restarted the game in Ottawa that night. I think that would be awesome. It would probably be relatively easy to do. The catch with that and with what JC was saying is as much as CSN having a rules analyst would help, which I, I don't think is a bad idea. It doesn't help the 20,000 people sitting there in confusion wondering what the heck is going on at these games, right? Like th these are the people who paid good, hard-earned money put the broadcast in a on tough the big screen, economy Easy. to sit there. Done. Oh, yeah, that, that fixes it. Can I, I, it into well, the state. I mean, officials on the field provide an explanation. I don't know why you can't just – piping into you know Andre Pru's headset to give a full body explanation of to why the call was made just like he would for any other penalty I I mean at the end of the day boys this is a tough situation it's one that that does it like the, the one that ground that, that grinded my gears ground my gears I'll correct myself later was the pass interference on Elijah McGee we saw Deshaun Amos do the exact same thing to Nick Dembski two weeks ago in the Toronto-Winnipeg game. Command Center reviewed it, didn't overturn it. So I'm sitting there in the press box in Ottawa going, well, I've seen this review already. This is not going to get overturned, and Ottawa's going to win. Corey Mace throws the challenge flag, wins the challenge, and we keep playing Now, when the Command Center was implemented in 2009, there was one person, Jake Ireland, who was a legendary official who officiated a ton of Grey Cups, who was the guy in the booth, and it was the same from game to game, week to week. That's no longer the case. We have random people, week by week, 
in the command center, which I do think is a problem. I don't think we should say because you no people. longer have there's objective. Well, I r- there's random people from a pre-approved list of replay officials. Uh, uh, yeah, they're not they're not pulling in Joe from 42nd Avenue being like, "You're the replay official today, kid." No, but it it it's Joe it's one Front of Street, a number of say. people. Where where's Front Street? I think that's where the CFL office is. It's on Front Street. Oh, Street. okay. We'll have to ask the skip. We'll have to ask the skip the dishes guy where he set the nachos. <laughs> but the uh, to me that is one area that you could immediately improve. Improve this is just have one replay official, and that way at least the replays would theoretically be consistent from week to week. But again, I'm not Street. convinced that this 50 is fifty Wellington Street. I think where the head office. Is. Thank you. To me, looking at what transpired on Thursday, I'll put it this way. No part of me thought, you know what would make this better? A bunch more rules and a bunch more people being involved. What I left thinking was, this is way too complicated to not even be working. It might be time to pare this down and simplify it. That's my take. I I get your point, Hodge. I also think... Like if we're going to criticize officiating, criticize calls, like we did that PI challenge against Deshaun Amos, we also need to allow room for growth because it's entirely possible that the command center made that non-call on that particular challenge, and then there was a discussion after the fact saying, "Hey, we messed this up. This is the rule here. In future, this is how we want it called," and then they executed that correctly by the definitions in the rule book for this game. That could be seen as a sign of growth that that missed call wasn't replicated here. Unfortunately, it doesn't help from a consistency standpoint, yeah. but, but there does need to be room for and, calls to be corrected going forward. And and that's, that's well said. But then if I'm Elijah McGee, I've got my hand up going, hold on. Why am I the bum in this situation? I just saw somebody do this two weeks ago. And they were fine, right? If you're if you're going to 65 in a 60 zone and the person in front of you is going the same speed, they don't get a ticket you do? How's that fair to you? Oh, it's a different cop on duty. Sorry, bud. That's not fair either. I, I, I get what you're that's saying, fair, but though. that's not how time works. Uh, yeah, that's not how time works. Like, you can't go back in time and, and make everything equal. And when a mistake is made, you can't then say, okay, well, we made a mistake this time. We're going to make the same mistake every single time going forward Did you not watch just because it's fair for everyone. <laughs> I, I actually haven't watched Back to the Future. What? <laughs> that movie's so good. All, all I know is there's some weird stuff going on between him and his mom. Well, Casey, you can't yeah, run fast yeah, enough to go yeah. back in time. <laughs> that is an accurate in assessment. Fa- in fairness, Marty did not run to get back to the future. I also can't either. drive a DeLorean, right. so I think it's also accurate. You can't drive anything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, boy. Canadian quarterback Nathan Rourke was released by the Atlanta Falcons on Sunday and has since cleared waivers after completing three of 13 pass accounts, ouch, in the team's preseason opener against Miami. What do you think comes next for Rourke? Let me add a little note there, okay? Three of those passes were definitely catchable. Nathan Rourke probably didn't know many of the names in that offensive huddle. He had been there for like 10 days or less. And he gets in there for one quarter and the Atlanta Falcons are like, no, we're good. We don't want to see you anymore. Like remember when Raheem Morris said that they were high on this kid. I will say, I thought it was odd because in answering that same question. And I think it was JC who wrote that article for us, laid it out so well that Mm. Morris talked about how he liked that the Atlanta scouting staff was so good at turning over the bottom of the roster. And I just found that odd, you know, like, especially with Austin Mack being released as well. Like the guy, to my knowledge, didn't even have a target in that first game. And you already know that he's not good enough to make the roster. 
it just doesn't make sense to me. And then they bring back, I believe it was John Paddock, who they had released from Rourke to give him the opportunity. And he had been there for organized training activities and actually had somewhat of a grasp of the offense. Like my point being, if you're going to sign a guy and release somebody else, at least give Rourke some time to learn the offense. You know what I mean? Like give him another week, see if he bounces back from this. And I understand it's politics and Taylor Heineke has had a bunch of starts in the NFL, but arguably he looked worse than Rourke did. And Morris in his post game comments was talking about how he felt like Atlanta got better as the game went along. I'm kind of paraphrasing here running the football. I'm like, did you watch the same football game? I did from multiple standpoints. Like I'm happy at least that, Morris and the Falcons listed, and they didn't waste Rourke's time, okay? They didn't waste his time. But as for your question, (laughs) I think Rourke will, at least in my estimation, try to see this through as long as he can. Because the last couple of years in the NFL, over 60, count them, over 60 quarterbacks have started football games. And I know it was a bad performance. Hodge, I'll leave that to you. But are you not telling me, NFL, the big bad NFL, that Nathan Rourke ain't good enough to be in the top 60 quarterbacks in the world and potentially start a football game? Obviously, injuries have to happen, but this extended season in the NFL leaves you having to rely, very similar to the CFL, on at least a couple of decent quarterbacks on your roster to start games. And I think that he deserves another opportunity to at least learn an offense and show what he can do because he showed that in Jacksonville, that there's some upside when he was with the Jaguars for the entire training camp, learned that offense, had a chance under Doug Peterson. I actually think going back to Jacksonville can make a lot of sense, but it seems like their quarterback depth chart is locked in with Trevor Lawrence, Mac Jones and CJ Beathard, who was last year's, Back up now the third stringer. You know, perhaps they bring in a fourth quarterback because Rourke knows the offense. But I think he's going to see this as far as he possibly can. I agree that that's what work will do. And I think that's what work should do, right? We talked about it on the show last week. If, if Nathan's coming back to the CFL, he's going to be the most highly sought after free agent in decades. And teams should be working their tails off to make an incredible pitch. And I know there's Sam Peters fans out there going, Hey, we should bring in Rourke now as our guy, or, or there's fans in Saskatchewan going, Hey, until Trevor Harris is back, we should, we should try to bring in. I'm sorry. If you're Nathan Rourke's agent and you get a call from a CFL team saying, Hey, we're going to sign Nathan to a modest deal to help us get through the rest of this year. I, you're just hanging up the phone right there. Like, like you're not even listening. Like that's garbage. However, this was a bad performance. Three of 13. I don't care that some of these balls should have been caught. Last year, Nathan Rourke lit it up in the preseason, and that got him a PR spot. The NFL is not a meritocracy. If you are a high draft pick, you can stink in the preseason, and you will stay on the roster. The same is true if you got a ton of money in free agency. If you got a huge signing bonus to come to a team and you stink, they will keep you because they don't want egg on their face. Nathan Rourke is an undrafted free agent from a relatively small school who played in the CFL. He has to be better than everybody else. And not only was he not better than everybody else here, he was not good. Nah, now, better I still think Ryan. he's a very good quarterback. I do Taylor Heineke might not even make that team. I'm just right? saying. Like, he has to be plus one, and he was minus one on the day. And again, I'm not saying that as a quarterback, he is not good. Based on this one performance, that yes, he was not in Atlanta a long time. No, he's not super familiar with these receivers. All that, I get it. But it was not a very good performance at all. And that obviously cost him his opportunity in Atlanta. Could he get another NFL opportunity? Of course. Frankly, I hope he does. He's been with four different NFL teams now. On the one hand, hey, that's pretty cool. One eighth of the league wanted you. On the other hand, you've now played your way or been cut for reasons beyond your control 
from an eighth of the league. And you're really hoping that a fifth team wants you. So it's not a good de- development for Rourke south of the border. Again, I think he's smart for pursuing this opportunity to its fullest extent, certainly for the rest of 2024. But this performance was not good. Unlike last year's preseason, where he was getting retweets from Patrick Mahomes for the sensational plays he was making. So I'm not surprised that he got cut. I also think Rourke will try try to extend this as long as he can. And frankly, it behooves him to do so because the one element that I don't think anyone's discussed about this is the fact that the NFL teams that have been kicking the tires on Rourke or bringing him in and looking at him right now, well, those same teams are looking at another guy named Rourke, his brother Curtis, who's currently about to enter his final collegiate season after transferring to Indiana University. And what I'm hearing is that NFL teams are much, much higher on Curtis right now than they are on Nathan. And if Curtis delivers on that promise and has a good season at a big-time school, which is why he transferred, and to get it, can get into that NFL draft conversation, potentially get selected, and maybe become somebody with some currency in the National Football League, I think by extension, that'll help Nathan as well, just by reputation, just by connections, just by network. Not to say that he needs to piggyback off his, his little brother. He's got all the tools to do things of his own merit. But I think, unfortunately in a league that relies on relationships, that is something coming down the pipe that could actually help Nathan if he's clinging on to a roster spot by his fingertips to have that connection if his brother becomes a legitimate draft prospect, which remains to be seen. In terms of what's happening right now, though, I was surprised in the last public uh, interview that that Rourke gave, and I believe it was with Matthew Cause on TSN Radio in Toronto, just how frank he was about how difficult this situation is. He called it an ongoing struggle to make the NFL and talked about just how limited his reps have been. We all saw the reports that he got no reps whatsoever with the Giants at the start of training camp. He seemed to indicate Uh, after just under a week in Atlanta, that he had been in the same situation there, that he had not received very many reps at all. And that's just the nature of the beast when you're in an NFL training camp and you're the last guy on the depth chart. But I don't think that's a situation in which Rourke excels. And I think we saw that manifest in the preseason, unfortunately. From his time in BC, there were moments when he started games a little flat. He needed a series or two, a couple off throws to dial in because he has remade his mechanics and sometimes his throws go a little bit high and he needs to readjust to make the throws. And we all know how successful he can be once that happens, but it doesn't look great instantly. And for as good as he looked in the CFL, Until he left, he had never been in a situation where he wasn't the primary person getting reps in practice every week. He sat behind Michael Riley for a full season as a rookie, but Riley was held together by duct tape. He was injured that whole year, and the guy getting the starter reps in practice was Rourke. That's why the BC Lions were so comfortable with naming him the starter with almost no experiences because he got every single rep in practice for a full season. He had never been in that situation before where he had to make the most of one, two, three throws per practice with all the eyes on you and try and show out on those throws. I don't think he's thriving in it right now. I think it's a reason why he can't catch on. Once he does get the right opportunity with the people around him, knows an offense, we've shown... We've seen what a gamer he can be, just like he was last year in the preseason for Jacksonville. I think that shocked even people who are watching him in practice there in Duval County. But he is not good being thrust in with no opportunity to tune himself in. Unfortunately, that's the life he signed up for as a depth quarterback in the NFL. No, no, it's it's incredibly difficult. difficult. And that's why these guys so often end up in the CFL, right? Everybody struggles like that. That That's why so few of them make it. It's 
not an easy thing. It's an immensely difficult thing. It's one of the toughest jobs to break into in all of sports. And unfortunately, Rourke is is experiencing the journey that so many have in that he's bouncing around and struggling to crack the back end of the roster. Let's explain how difficult this can be, okay? You were there for 10 days or less trying to learn a brand new offense that is going to have a bunch of different verbiage and checks and calls that you've probably never heard in your life or that might be similar from some of the other NFL teams he's been on, but will be definitely called something different in that offense. And oh, by the way, you get no reps, so you're taking what they call like mental reps. You see the quarterbacks in, let's say, the Netflix documentary quarterback and the backups behind them or on Hard Knocks, the backup quarterbacks taking phantom drops and going through their reads. You know, that's great, but it's not giving you the timing. And the most important thing when you're playing the quarterback position is that trust And having some sort of an idea when a receiver is going to gear down and break off the route or how they're going to run the fade route in the end zone. We saw a couple of those throws from work that was off the mark. It's difficult. This is not easy. So when you go into that situation for Rourke in the fourth quarter, you kind of have to just trust it and throw it to a spot. Now, there were a couple of throwaways that I thought were smart. And yes, those count on your stats. But... That is the reality. I felt like he didn't want to force the football at all. But you could see it even on the third and seven completion that he had that I think was the first one of the game. He kind of double clutches because he wants to make sure that the receiver actually runs the route that was designed. Just to put this into context, fellas, let's think about this. Rort gets there and has 10 days or less in the offense to learn a whole new system, verbiage, and the rest. He doesn't have, it seems like, next to any reps live running the offense. So essentially, he goes out there in the fourth quarter, playing with a bunch of guys he just met, may or may not even know their names, and is running plays that he's probably never even run with them before and trying to look competent. Like, it was a situation designed for failure. And as much as me personally wanted to see him get in the football game, I thought as it was going along that it might actually be better if Taylor Heineke plays this out or if Michael Penix Jr. goes longer, Taylor Heineke splits it and Rourke gets more time in the offense before he's put on the field. And I truly think that would have been better. It's easy to say in hindsight, but that's how difficult a situation this was. He's throwing to guys that he doesn't even know how well they're going to run a certain play or if they're going to hit their landmark on a certain route. You could see that on the third and seven throw that he had to OJ Hilaire. He double clutched that throw. And yes, it was still a completion, but he wasn't sure if Hilaire was going to break and come back to him on the stop route, the hitch route, whatever you want to call it. I think that is important for people to realize It's not making excuses. It's the reality. And also the reality is Rourke wears how he played because he was released. It's difficult. It's the NFL. It's part of the politics. And it's part of being an undrafted guy from the CFL who played at Ohio University. The end of the day, it's the NFL. It's hard. Right. This was never going to be easy. It was very hard. It It was a tough test. He failed it. That's why he's cut. Hopefully, he gets to write another one. Boys, we could have as many as six quarterback changes in Week 11 as Trevor Harris likely returns for the Riders. Cody Fajardo could be back for Montreal. Taylor Powell and Jeremiah Masoli are expected to start for Hamilton and Ottawa, respectively. And Trey Ford might miss time for the Elks, giving the reins back to McLeod Bethel-Thompson. It also seems possible that maybe even Vernon Adams Jr. could play for the BC Lions. JC, which quarterback change are you most excited about or surprised by? I think a number of these changes are intriguing and could change the entire fabric of what these teams look like. But the one that shocked me and surprised me is the move to bench Bo Levi Mitchell and move on to Taylor Powell and... The quickness and the definitiveness 
with which it was made. Bo Levi Mitchell is still the leading passer in the Canadian Football League as we record this podcast. He's also the leader in passing touchdowns. Now, in all fairness, he leads in interceptions as well, but statistically, he has had one of the better seasons that he's had in the last five years. He was having a career renaissance, it seemed like, and for a team that I think lacks talent in a lot of areas, he was doing all right. But that wasn't good enough for Scott Milanovic, clearly because those turnovers he believes are the reason for the losses. And after just two series, three of four for 25 yards and one pick, he got pulled it from that football game and replaced by Taylor Powell. And after the game, Milanovic was clear that Powell is going to be the one who starts next week and potentially going forward. It seemed like a shocking move. It still seems like a shocking move. And I'm not entirely sure it's the correct one because while Milanovic has a point regarding the turnovers and Powell did look good in his 55 minutes of action in that game, throwing for over 300 yards, the reality is Powell didn't win this football game either. And if Milanovic is focused on the wins and losses here and believes that regardless of if you're leading the league in passing, you have to get wins, well, the backup hasn't shown that he can win either. And as much as he was the winningest quarterback for the Ticats last year, he still had a losing record as a starter. I'm not sure this move is going to do anything for a team that frankly has weaknesses at other positions that are dragging the quarterbacks down. The quarterback switch that I'm most excited about is Trevor Harris because before he got hurt in week three against the aforementioned Hamilton Tiger Cats, he was leading league in passing yards. He was leading league in touchdown passes. I think the Riders have a lot of weapons there on that offense and Harris getting the ball out quickly will help this offensive line who has gone through already four starters at the right tackle spot due to largely injuries. Jermarcus Hardrick got hurt, could be out for the entire season. Jacob Brammer got hurt in practice. Then Brandon Council came back for a cup of coffee, essentially didn't play well enough, so he retired, went back to his job at Auburn University. Nick Jones started against the Ottawa Red Blacks and We'll see who starts against the Montreal Alouettes. Logan Furlan took first team reps at right tackle position. He's filled in at during games this season, but just hasn't started there. So that right tackle spot has had some turnover for the riders, but with what Trevor Harris does, how quickly he processes and also the quick release, I think can really help this Saskatchewan offense play great football and complement a defense that except for the game against the Edmonton Elks, has played at a fairly consistently high level and a special teams unit that also has done well as a whole and has Mario Alford, who, yes, has returned to kickoff for a touchdown this season, but has had multiple also brought back by penalty. I like both your answers. McLeod, Bethel, or pardon me, uh, we talk about Bo Levi Mitchell, right? That reminded me of what a team comes into the season and fires the coach after like three games. Mm-hmm. If 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 you're going to fire the coach that early, you should have just fired him in the offseason, right? If you're going to pull your quarterback five minutes into the game, he shouldn't be starting. Why is he starting? Just start Taylor Powell. If that's the guy you want starting, that made no sense to me. I'm also excited to see Trevor Harris because the Trevor Harris era, the Hera, if you will, in Regina has included very little Trevor Harris, right? It's like when you read the side of the chocolate syrup bottle and you go, there's no actual chocolate in here, right? That That's what it's like in Regina right now. I want to see Trevor Harris in the Trevor Harris era. We haven't seen that yet. However, my answer is different. I'm most excited for the not yet confirmed, but hopeful return of Cody Fajardo. Why? Because the Saskatchewan Rough Riders have yet to welcome him back to Regina. The Alouettes did not play in Saskatchewan last season. Ryder fans have not seen Cody since he was wearing green and white. 
The Alouettes are 8-1. and one. Fajardo hasn't played in a few weeks. I am super excited for this storyline. We know Trevor Harris, former Alouette, Cody Fajardo, former rider. We've yet to see it in person. What better way to celebrate that connection, that new rivalry, than with a game at Mosaic Stadium. I'm excited, boys. I want this to be the matchup. Come on. That is a juicy, juicy storyline to watch, Hodge. But I'm shocked that there's no love here for Jeremiah Mazzoli after everything that that man has been through. I mean, we sat on this podcast, and we, of course, didn't want to outright speculate, but... When he went down with that injury last year after what had happened the year previous, I think all of us were thinking his career's over, right? If we weren't saying it, that's what was going through our minds. And here he is, recovered, works his way back, renegotiates his contract, sits there as a third stringer. Now he's going to get a chance to start another football game for the Ottawa Red Blacks. It may not be the most impactful change. It may not be even the most exciting change. But I think it's certainly the one that makes you feel the most warm and fuzzy. Full credit to Jeremiah Masoli for battling through multiple devastating injuries the mental strength that it takes to get through that is unbelievable. So I think that is the one that pulls at CFL fans' feels around the league. And I think everybody who watches the CFL would like to see him play well in this start and see if he's still got it. Fully the CFL agree. released a statement Fully agree. this week indicating that are reviewing its credential policy following what they called an inexcusable incident during the latest stages of Thursday's game in Ottawa, during which an individual who wasn't permitted to enter the bench area interacted with players and team personnel. Hodge, you were there when all of this happened. What can you tell us? Well, I think I have the full story, uh, and I want to give credit to Kenzie Lalon, the TSN sideline reporter who we uh, we we connected at BMO Field actually the next day in Toronto to compare notes because she was at field level I was in the press box um, I was in Bob Dice's post game availability when he talked about this I talked to a half dozen players in the locker room about it as well um, essentially what happened here was when the play was being reviewed unbeknownst to anybody in the stadium everybody thought the game was over I went to take the elevator down to field level. And I was politely told by the gentleman who was running the elevator. There's only one elevator in Ottawa, or if there's multiple, I was only aware that one was there that they were holding it for the coaches, right? Right after a game is done, it's normal for the coaches, you know, some from both teams who are in the booth to immediately head down to the locker room. So I said, yeah, not a problem. Politely waited. And all the coaches walked by me, Alex Suber for the red blacks, a few others, uh, Jordan Lennon, um, Mark Mueller for the riders, a few others. They all got in the elevator. They went down and I started waiting for the next one. As I was waiting, about 30 seconds went by. I heard an announcement from the field that the game was in fact not over. Obviously the coaches wouldn't have heard that announcement until they'd gotten to field level and emerged from the tunnel. Now, one of the issues in predominantly East division stadiums is that players are on the same side of the field, right? Out West, at least, I believe all five stadiums have the benches on opposite sidelines. It's not the case at TD Play Stadium. And unlike BMO, that has kind of a clear divi- like like marking where you're not supposed to be between the benches, it, it just kind of looks like a free-for-all in Ottawa. And so what Kenzie told me is that there was a guy in a green hat who was kind of the first one to start a little bit of animosity between the two teams who was barking at the red blacks to stay on their side of the 55 yard line. I showed her a picture (laughs) that I take it on my phone from a distance of Mark Mueller, the offensive coordinator for the riders and said, is this the person she said? Absolutely. She didn't, she didn't realize he was a coach because of course he wasn't on the sideline for the first 99% of the game. He was in the booth. So that's kind of what started it. However, that is not why the blood boiled over following the game that started it 
But I think that that commotion caused was somebody who the league says was credentialed. Now, I had my credential on as somebody who was just there for the day. It was a stuck on orange sticker that they give you with your name and your, your affiliation and the date, whatever. This person was not wearing a credential, though, according to the league, he was entitled to be at field level. Um, what I believe happened is he stepped in thinking he was being helpful to try to kind of break things up between the two benches. The issue is he used language that the Ottawa Red Blacks believe contained racial overtones, which is what Bob Dice, the head coach of the Ottawa Red Blacks, took great offense to. And the individual that he described had a nose ring, a beard, and a camouflage jacket. Um, there was an individual matching that subscription, that, that uh, description between the benches. And I think a lot of people suspected this person was a fan. My sources lead me to believe that he was actually there connected to a CFL staff member. Possibly, I've had multiple sources indicate he's married to a CFL staff member. And I did, for an unrelated photo I took at the end of the fourth quarter, notice when I zoomed in, he was standing right beside on the sideline a woman with blonde hair who had been there before the game. And they were standing kind of between the benches, but not really close to the benches. When tempers boiled over, he was right up there. And part of the confusion was that the Red Black saw him kind of talking to the riders and, and jawing with the riders. And then he went over to the Red Blacks and, and started jawing with them. So, so I think the riders thought that he was with the Red Blacks. The Red Blacks thought he was with the riders. And in fact, he was with nobody. And the CFL, through the statement that they gave us, made it clear that Though he was permitted at field level, he was not permitted in the bench area and certainly was not permitted to speak to either team. Um, so that that's more or less what happened. This is not somebody who was a fan and stuck on the field and everybody thought the game was over. And one last thing I want to say, I just want to say this as a blanket statement because we know that the hardcores listen to this podcast and we love our listeners so much. I got so many tweets from people immediately post-game demanding answers for what had happened or accusing me of just taking one side of the story because I was talking to the Red Blacks, not the Riders. By the way, at least on this night, the Riders did not permit local media to talk to their players. It was Zoom only. And also, as we know, but maybe the uninitiated don't know, you can't cover both locker rooms post-game. You have to just go to one, right? The availabilities happen simultaneously. You can't, you can't go to one, do interviews for 15 minutes, and then go to the next one and expect anybody to still be there. They're going to be gone. Especially the away teams, they got a plane to catch. They don't stay over, generally speaking, the night after a game. They they fly back immediately once everybody's showered and gets on the bus. When I was speaking to the Red Blacks, one of the interviews I did, the player told me straight up and down, yes, this individual who I saw stirring stuff up was a rider staff member. The Red Blacks player who told me that was obviously ill-informed because it's since been confirmed, no. This person's not attached to the riders. So journalism like this takes time. If you want it to be accurate, and we demand that journalists be accurate, you can't also demand that it's immediate. And please don't complain if I don't put every detail on Twitter and instead write an article, or in this case, pass the notes to JC, who wrote the article from home. Thank you for doing that, JC. You did a great job. Because first of all, Twitter is not a place for nuance. It is a place for hot takes and garbage. And secondly, if I am there representing Three Down Nation, I want the journalism that I do to be represented on Three Down Nation. So that was my coverage of the evening. That was my takeaway from the evening. I just ask for grace, not for myself, but for any journalist or reporter covering a situation involving not just like two people who maybe had a misunderstanding. Like there are dozens of people in the situation, all of whom experience different stuff. I have some of it on video. Some of it's coming from other reporters. It took several days to do this, this, this journalism, this research, talking to multiple sources on and off the record, and also talking with other reporters to corroborate what they saw versus what I saw. It's a complex situation. Please do not demand immediacy if you want accuracy. Because had I just jumped with the first report of, oh, a Red Blacks player told me it was a Red Blacks guy, or pardon me, a Red Blacks player told me it was a Ryder guy, and I tweet that out, I'd be, I'd be having to, to put a retraction out there. Because this person was not connected to the Riders in any way. So that's how the story came about. That's what I believe happened. 
And I hope that people, first of all, appreciate the the story being told. I do think it's a big story. To me, this is actually a bigger story than the command center thing, but maybe Ryder Nation feels differently. And whether it's even sports related or not, when it comes to journalism of complex situations, please try to use patience because if you don't want journalists to just get crap out there the fastest that they possibly can, you need to you need to use a little bit of patience. As much as we all want answers right away, I wish I could wave a magic wand and have figured out this whole story instead of having a million different conversations about it. Especially when I was on what was supposed to be <laughs> mostly a, pre- a pleasure trip, not a work trip. But I did it. I don't regret doing it. I'm thrilled that we had a reporter there on the ground. And hopefully a situation like this does not happen again for the for the sake of the league and those involved because I know there are some people who are deeply offended by what took place on the bench yeah kudos to you Hodge for taking time out of your trip to do that I know obviously you're credentialed to be there in your media capacity so it's not entirely pleasure when you're at the game but you were there to experience the atmosphere and observe it in that capacity not to deal with a breaking and sensitive story like this one and you make a very important point about how integral it is to the work we do to make sure we get all the facts right and we are sensitive when approaching these issues because you had a situation here where individuals were unidentified. You don't want to name a person or or point a finger in the wrong direction here when there is allegations of potentially offensive language and you don't have all the details. And you also want to be very careful when it's a situation where you haven't seen necessarily the entire altercation. Fortunately, it doesn't seem like it came to actual blows, but it was certainly physical at points. And you don't know what may have gone on in that fray. You need to find out all the facts. It seems like we have pieced together most of the puzzle here in terms of what happened. The league is right to make a review of this policy because if someone's not doing an act job between the benches frankly they shouldn't be there and they should never be allowed there again if they go up to and speak to players or staff members during a football game i don't condone the physicality which with with which the uh, red blacks responded but i also have some degree of sympathy for bob dice uh, to be in that situation where you feel like you or your players, as a coach myself, are being harassed or um, you know insulted or attacked in some way, I certainly would also have an emotional reaction in that situation. Hopefully, I wouldn't get physical, but it certainly would be something where it would cause my my heart rate to go up a little bit and the blood to rush to my face, just as it did for Bob Dice. So this was a very difficult situation to source out because we only caught glimpses here or there. I'm glad that we have most of the story and that actions seem to be being taken to correct it going forward. Kudos to Mr. John Hodge for getting his nose dirty on a trip that was supposed to be mostly for enjoyment. So full credit to you, Hodge, for doing that. We're lucky we had you there, but you brought it on yourself, bro. You called this. <laughs> I did. I yourself. jinxed it. I did. And and also, one quick note for anybody who gets the opportunity ever to watch a professional football game from field level. Shut up. <laughs> Don't say anything. Don't talk to the players. Don't talk to the coaches. If you're on the field level, just be there. <laughs> you could get punched in the face, right? It's like, not like a good business decision. Players, <laughs> no, it's a bad business decision. Don't say anything. I, I, I'll, t- I'll, say, I'll tell a very quick story. And actually, it has a modern CFL connection because the player in question was Corey Philpot, father of Tyson and Jalen. When I was a kid, I, went to, I was, I think, 10 years old. I went to Blue Bombers fan day. Corey Philpot wore number nine for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers at the time. Really good running back, fumbled a lot, but was a really good player. He saw me wearing his number nine. I had a number nine jersey on. And he was so excited I was there wearing the number nine that he said, next bomber game, I'm going to get you on the field. You're going to to be on the sideline. Great. Actually, I might have even been younger than 10. I might have been eight. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm a little kid. 
Well, physically, I'm pretty large, but I'm young in age is my point. Anyway, my dad brings me to the sideline, tells the security guard what happened at, at Fan Day. And the security guard kind of, you know, he's like, well, did you talk to anybody on the team about anyway? We didn't have any documentation with us. It was the 90s, right? We didn't have anything. He has no way to verify this. My dad keeps talking to him. Finally, after a long discussion, we get onto the field, at least at field level, with like 10 minutes left in the game. And I'll never forget standing where fans are supposed to stand on the sideline and a security guard, different one, hunkered down, bent his knees, got right, looked me straight in the eye, and he said, just one thing, if any of the players get anywhere close to you, run like hell. And it was the first time I think I ever saw or ever heard an adult swear. And his fear wasn't that like the players were going to mess with me. It was that like somebody would run a corner route towards the sideline, right? And I'd get barreled over. And uh, lo and behold, at one point, that happened where guys came pouring off to the sideline. And I did exactly what he told me to, which was I hightailed it as fast as I could. And I did not get hit, which I appreciated. Uh, but that is vivid in my mind. So if you're ever on the sideline, first of all, run like hell. If the players, you know, spill out off, off to the sideline as often happens, but also don't talk to them. It's a bad idea. They're very emotional at that point of the game. Just don't talk. We've officially reached the midway point of the 2024 regular season. If you were to hand out an end of the year award right now, which player would you give it to and why? Well, I think there's a number of good candidates for other for for different awards, but the one that stands out to me, and you're going to be very excited by this dunk because I know you have a similar opinion, is Roland Milligan, the outstanding halfback for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Right now, not only would right, I you're give him my pick, not, not only <laughs> well, I, I will go a step further than just giving him most outstanding defensive player because the way that Vernon Adams Jr. played for the two weeks. Before he got hurt, I think that knocked him out of top spot for MOP. I would give the MOP at the midway point of the season to Roland Milligan Jr. I think he has been outstanding. He is the best defensive player in the league right now. And I think he's the best player, period, in the league right now in terms of the caliber of play that he's playing at. It would be unusual, certainly, for a DB to win either of those awards, but I think Milligan right now deserves to do both. I would imagine that a defensive back has never won the league's most outstanding player award. And it's ultra rare for a defensive back to even win the most outstanding defensive player award, but Roland Milligan jr. In an absolute runaway at the moment, we're talking about a guy who has 43 defensive tackles gets down and dirty if he needs to close or around the box. And oh, by the way, 13 special teams tackles. And I haven't even mentioned his league leading six interceptions. And he's got NFL fans who are defensive backs, highly paid in the National Football League, like one Darius Slay, retweeting his interceptions. So perhaps he's learned from those fans who are elite athletes down there but since you took my pick I'll pivot because the only other runaway nominee that I say right now is Janarian Grant for most outstanding special teams player that is a lead pipe stone cold lock honestly even if he didn't even return another touchdown but that sound you hear it's the fans getting excited I think he's brought another one back okay this dude has been unbelievable and there needs to be some credit given to his coach there, Mickey Donovan, who not only has helped Grant get loose, but helped Javon Leak get loose to win the same award last season. So that is incredible that the Argos could go back to back and have the league's most outstanding special teams player when switching their returner from year to year. Unbelievable. But it leads me into the most outstanding player conversation because we all thought it was going to be Vernon Adams Jr. running away with it. And part of the reason he came back to the pack is him being hurt. But this award, dare I say, fellas, is as wide open as it's ever been halfway through a CFL regular season. 
I fully agree with you guys that Roland Milligan Jr. is the most outstanding defensive player in the CFL right now. For the record, a DB has won the award a grand total of one time ever in league history. That was Jovan Johnson at corner, winning it in 2011 as part of the then coolly known, now cringily known Swaggerville defense. I don't think he is the MOP. And I certainly don't think by the end of the year he's going to be the MOP. But you raise an excellent who's point. Who's the MOP right? right now? Well, Bo, Bo Levi Mitchell got benched. Vernon Adams Jr. got hurt. Tyson Philpot. Bo Levi Mitchell hurt. can't even be mentioned in the MOP conversation, bro. Are you crazy? Did JC pass you some of that BC grass? <laughs> I, I don't touch the BC grass. I, I have the, what do they call it? The, when you eat a lot, when you, I, I have the munchies even sober. So no, I don't touch, I don't, I don't touch that. Um, but the meat my sweat pick right is now. seeping into your brain. You got the meat sweats. <laughs> hey, I do. I do sweat and I do like meat. So yeah, I, I won't deny that. Justin McInnes, I think would be my pick for MOP right now. He is on pace for almost 1,700 yards and 12 touchdowns. And when you look at some of the MOP numbers that receivers have put up on seasons where they have won that award, that is right there with them historically. Now, the question is, how long is Vernon Adams Jr. out? Because Jake Dolagala, as we saw this past week, just doesn't have that same sauce that VA has in this offense. And obviously that is going to negatively affect the receivers there. Alexander Hollins had a quiet game this past week against Edmonton. Justin McKinnis had a quiet game this past week against Edmonton. He also put up literally nothing against Winnipeg two weeks ago. So he's a little, a little bit of a slump, but I do think that that recency bias of the last two games shouldn't overlook the fact that through the first seven weeks of the season, he was truly Incredible. So he will be my pick right now. But yes, we will obviously. Bro, what have about to Tyson Philpott? Him. He's right there. Well, with he's hurt. He well, he is. It's like he's a hundred yards behind yeah. him. It's like eighty yards behind him. Well, sorry, he's about fifty yards. yards. No, sorry about about. Oh, it's like fifty yards behind and one fewer touchdown uh, in the same number of games. So that's why I go with Justin McKinnis, and, and also again because it appears Tyson Philpott's going to be out for at least the the near future with that injury. I know he's undergoing an MRI following this past week's injury. So we'll have to wait and see, but I do 100% agree with you, Justin, in that this award is the most wide open it's been in a long time last year. You know, even by this point, it was, it was a pretty tight, like three, maybe four horse race, right? People talking about Chad Kelly, Brady Oliveira, VA and, and really Zach Claris, right? There's four guys right now. You could honestly make a short list of 10 Mm. and you could realistically argue for them all. So fortunately we have another half of the season to go before we have to make this decision. Yeah. And there's some other races that I think are just as wide open as well. I mean, most outstanding Canadian, you mentioned the two top candidates in Phil pot and Justin McKinnis. They are, have both been outstanding to this point in the year, but most outstanding rookie is another one that I look at and I go, Oh, who's going to win this? Cause you've got huge numbers from guys like Shamar Bridges and Ontario Wilson, Khalil Pimpleton pushing up despite playing, you know, far fewer games than these guys, other guys hitting their strike, even Nick Anderson, I think with the Edmonton Elks, uh, their rookie linebacker has put up some, interesting numbers on the defensive side of the ball. That's going to be the race that I'm watching as this season progresses. Cause I think some people have had their stats inflated by being parts of bad teams. How much does that get reflected in the voguing? Ultimately it's going to be intriguing to see which one of those receivers, especially emerges and really locks his locks their, their claws into that most outstanding rookie award. I think we, we need to talk about the most outstanding offensive lineman award. We can't just ignore the Hoggies. Right now, my vote would go to Pierre Olivier Lestage, mm. left guard for the Montreal Alouettes. This award generally does go to the best offensive lineman on the best team. That being said, I think you could make an argument 
for a number of guys, including Ryan Hunter, who I thought should have won this award last year with the Toronto Argonauts, Nick Callender, who's had a very good season for the Alouettes at left tackle. And in the West, maybe Logan Furland yeah. is that guy. I mean, he's, he's reportedly bouncing out to tackle if he plays brilliantly at right tackle. I don't know how he doesn't get the nomination coming out of the West Division. So I'm interested to see what happens with the Hoggies. It's now time for Hodges' heritage moment. On this day in 2011, Anthony Calvillo threw his 400th career touchdown pass in a 24-7 victory over Edmonton, becoming the first player in CFL history to reach the milestone. The passer would eventually retire following the 2013 season with 455 touchdown passes, a record that still stands today. My question for you two, we'll start with Justin. Will anybody ever beat that number, 455? Do you think it's possible? I hate cliches, but they say records are made to be broken. But that is one that arguably might up be up there, excuse me, with Wayne Gretzky's career goals mark. Now, I know Alexander Ovechkin has given it chase, but that record has stood for quite a while. And 455 is a lot, even with the proliferation of the high completion percentage passing game. We haven't seen obscene touchdown numbers being put up by CFL quarterbacks. So I think it can stand for a while, but you're going to have to have a quarterback have not even just sustained sustain success, excuse me, for a long time, sustained greatness to pass that. That is an unbelievable number. Yeah, it it is about sustained greatness, right? You have to be somebody who's going to play into their early 40s to be able to pass this mark. And you have to be young and successful right now. I think if you look around the Canadian Football League, there is nobody that is currently under contract that has any hope of achieving this mark. And I say that with all due respect to a number of gentlemen who are going to be in the Hall of Fame one day with the likes of Bo Levi Mitchell and Zach Caleros and others who are going to push for enshrinement. To me, there is one player that is currently active in professional football that I think has maybe an outside chance. And that's if our good friend Nathan Rourke comes back to the CFL and does what he was able to do in his first season as a starter for another 15 years. If that is something that Nathan Rourke is capable of, and that's a tall task, don't get me wrong. I think he's the only one with the top end talent to get this done and potentially make Calvio sweat. I knew one of you guys was going to say Nathan Rourke. (laughs) For the record, to get there, that is the equivalent of having 15 30 touchdown seasons. Vernon Adams Jr. in his career has had one 30 touchdown season. Zach Kalar, I I don't have his numbers in front of me. Uh, Cody Fajardo has had zero 30 touchdown seasons. Uh, Bo Levi Mitchell has had two 30 touchdown seasons. And Zach, I think, has had two as well. Let me confirm that super quickly. Uh, Correct. He said two. So, just to give some modern perspective on how rare those are right now in the CFL, largely due to injury, right? We're not seeing a lot of quarterbacks play more than, you know, 14, 15 games in a year, which makes that tough. But I don't think we'll ever see it broken for the record, but I'm surprised Dunk didn't say Nathan and Trey Ford would break. It. A little surprised. <laughs> for the record, Nathan had 25 touchdowns in half a season. So, I mean, that this is true. Uh, that's a pretty good pace. Let's go to the three-minute drill. CFLPA Executive Director Brian Ramsey has left the union after eight years on the job to join the Professional Hockey Players Association. Will Ramsey be missed? 100% he will be. I think the CFLPA made almost unprecedented inroads during his tenure with the organization, certainly unprecedented in the last few decades. I think they did a fantastic job of negotiating, especially this latest round of CBA negotiations, getting a long deal done, getting a lot of things added to that CBA for players, uh, and especially this latest move of them getting workers' compensation and striking that 
could be groundbreaking. That I think is why Ramsey is suddenly a very sought after person in the sports labor world. It wouldn't surprise me if he goes even higher than the PHPA someday. The San Francisco 49ers released former CFL defensive back Eric Harris. Do you think he'll ever sign another CF NFL contract? Yeah, it's possible, but I think Harris at this stage is at the tail end of his NFL career. He was signed as a wily 34-year-old vet for the 49ers for their playoff push last year, but didn't see the field a ton. I think he's probably on his last legs. Maybe one more contract if a team gets a bunch of injuries and is desperate for somebody to come in with some experience, but not much more than that. Brandon Council retired after playing one game for the Riders this season. Why do you think he decided to step away, Dunk? I don't think the decision was entirely his. The Rough Riders might not agree. I don't think he played well. And I mean, it was a difficult situation considering he came off a full-time job at Auburn University with On to Victory, working with Jason Campbell there in student-athlete recruitment. So I think it was a bit of, well, I had this job and didn't necessarily play well. So we wish you well in your future endeavors. Drew Brown left week 10's tie against Saskatchewan in a walking boot though. Red Blacks head coach Bob Dice seems to believe the injury isn't serious. Is that good news for our nation fans? It is. And I also want to offer an apology to Red Blacks fans. I was at the game in Winnipeg where Drew Brown got hurt. I was at the game where he got hurt in Ottawa. I think I just have to stop going to Drew Brown games. I'm feeling like this is Jinx my is all over, Ja. No kidding. I I I have to stop going. I'm I and I don't think I'm seeing him in person again this year unless they go to the Grey Cup. If that happens, oh boy. The BC Lions have opened the upper bowl for this week's game against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. How many fans do you think will be in attendance? Well, if they're opening up the upper bowl, that means that they're going to be pushing 30,000 or at least they hope to. I am skeptical that they're going to be able to achieve something truly impressive here just because of how the team has played in their last three games, right? The Lens' big selling point has been that they've been an explosive offense, running hot, one of the best teams in the league. Well, the last three weeks, they stumbled against Calgary, they were shot out against Winnipeg, and they got spanked by the lowly Edmonton Elks. I think fans recognize that i'm not sure there's going to be quite the attendance for this Ouch, matchup being spanked hurts <laughs> <laughs> i would know about that i i uh i'm not the one being spanked so um <laughs> that is uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. this is going off when the, is the last time <laughs> yeah let's let's just move on let's just move on uh mm. The CFL is completing a thorough review uh, prior to ruling on possibly reinstating Argonauts quarterback Chad Kelly. Do you think he'll be back following Toronto's bye week? I don't think it's a foregone conclusion like a lot of people are talking about. People need to remember, he has to be reinstated. And there's a process here. And the CFL is walking a very... Fine line. Let's think of the blowback that happened with Chad Kelly just simply being on the practice field at Argos training camp. And let me tell you, CFL fans have not forgotten, regardless of what the real situation was from Kelly's perspective and his camp's perspective, this is a delicate matter for the CFL to deal with. And if he even does get reinstated, He has to get back up to football speed. Ryan Dinwiddie has talked about that a lot. So still some things to sort through there with Mr. Kelly. University of Manitoba Bisons head coach Brian Doby, one of a kind in Canadian university football, has decided to retire following the 2024 U-Sports season. Will he be missed in the peg? He will. I mean, Brian Doby, super gregarious, super friendly, super outgoing, always has a story. Great guy. And, uh, you know, somebody who he's he's been in the game for 50 years. Like this man is an institution. He's also younger than he looks. He's 71. He's not somebody you look at. 
It's crazy. Like, I'm not saying he looks 30, but yeah, he, he certainly doesn't look like he's 71. I'd probably guess he was in his early 60s. If that, super high energy. He reminds me a little Pete Carroll 50s. that way. Yeah, maybe late. I could see maybe late 50s. Uh, but obviously, he's run a very nice program at the University of Manitoba. Led them to a Vanier Cup in 2007. Maybe they'll win a Mitchell for him in his last year at the helm. The Stampeders and Elks dressed zero fullbacks this past week. JC, is the position slowly dying in the CFL as it did many years ago down south? I don't think that's necessarily an accurate statement. It's certainly not as important as it once was, but this was sort of coincidence for both of these teams. The Elks lost both of their fullbacks in the same game to injuries that put them on the six-game injured list, so they had no choice but to not play a fullback. The Stampeders were trying some things with injuries in other spots to get bodies elsewhere, and other teams around the league, the fullback is still one of the most important roles on special teams. And you even see multiple teams in the last number of years play American fullbacks, which are virtually unheard of. I know the Saskatchewan Rough Riders have had an American fullback in there all year long. If you're the playing American back. second spot. Clint Rakovich. Super back. Super back. Yes, indeed. The uh, CFL's answer to Kyle Juszczyk, uh although he hasn't caught as many passes as I expected him to. But if you're putting an American at that spot, it means that you value that position. So the fullback is not going to be dead in this league, at least for another few years. Former CFL All-Star receiver Austin Mack has been released by the Atlanta Falcons. Dunk, do you see him back in the CFL anytime soon? This one seems more possible than Nathan Rourke. That said, there was some NFL interest in Mac outside of his workout with the Atlanta Falcons, but he just decided to do that one because he had positive indications that the team was strongly leaning towards signing him. So let's see how that plays out for Mac in terms of the NFL interest. Definitely someone worth keeping an eye on, but it's not like the Alouettes need him back. We thank you as always for listening to the three down nation podcast. Please join JC and I later this week for our picks. I had another great week of picks. JC also did some picks and hey, I got the Elks always, right. I got the Elks right. Give me credit. Come yeah, on. Almost, now. almost, almost everybody else on our site did, bro. It's not that impressive. Come on now. Then join us, all three of us, for our show after week 11 in the CFL. Enjoy the games. We'll see you again soon.